Hey, what's up guys? It's Dan here from Cry Noir. How are we all doing today? Uh, we're on with episode 17 of my game making journey. It's been a while since the last one was up, but here we are. We're moving on. We're episode 17 now. In the last episode, we looked at some of my sort of failed games and, you know, sort of projects that I'd started on and hadn't finished and, and so on and so forth. So I decided right, it was time to get back into it and where better than to crack on with another Heartbeast tutorial. This one was his Westwick tutorial. Uh, it's available on Udemy. Uh, it's also available on his website. I will have links in the description below. So uh, yeah, I suppose without further ado, let's crack on and uh, let's have a look at this one. The first thing that struck me when starting Westwick was that the initial asset download for this tutorial was a pre-started project rather than the folder full of assets that you would need to import yourself. Once I launched the project, I saw why. Benjamin had elected to bypass all of the early setup that you would need to do for a tutorial series and started with all the basic work done. The project was full of sprites, particle effects, rooms and even some placeholder scripts. With that being said, the starting point for just about every game maker game is setting up the player object adding some code for movement and assigning a sprite and placing it into a room. We also created a solid object that could act as a barrier to contain the player. This could be stretched over the tiles below to make it look as though the walls were what were stopping the player without having to create lots and lots of individual wall objects. This approach worked really well when done correctly. Next up was some clever whizbangery that made some of the tiles be drawn on top of the player's layer. This gives the trees the illusion of being between the player's viewpoint and the moving sprites, giving the environment some much needed depth. We also created a script that would allow the players to traverse between rooms. The transition was a little sudden and choppy, so a nice fade transition was added. This transition was then altered and spiced up to create a dramatic flash when you entered into the battle. Though somehow I think there's a little more work to be done on this section. For the next lecture, Benjamin had us design our own room using the tile sets that he provided. Once the solid objects were in place and it was allocated a room designator, we then had three rooms to wander around in. And what happens when you wander around rooms in any turn-based JRPG? Random encounters! We set up a random chance script and object so that there was a random chance that when you were wandering around the rooms, you would get attacked by bad dudes. This would send you into the battle room where we had added some parallax scrolling to the transition. Might need to alter the chance variable for test purposes. Come on. Whoa! How sweet is that? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna do that again because it's fucking awesome. Anyway, next step was to add some battle sprites. As with all JRPGs, the main character had now lost their cutesy aesthetic and had body morphed into something with the proportions a little more conducive to battle. A GUI was added that showed both the players and the enemies' names, their health and their level, and now it was time to start kicking ass. The underlying code was added to give each combatant a charge meter and Elizabeth the ability to attack and do damage. None of the animations were in yet, but the fundamentals were there. I can't stress just how much code was written to get to this stage. We had to set up class types, a script to read from those class types, different states for idle, approach, attack, deal damage, transition between the overworld and the battle room and then back again. Benjamin had put so much work into this tutorial. Some more code later and now the spider could attack back, but without animations and the ability to die, it turned battles into like a really surreal world where a spider and a girl were destined to slide backwards and forth into each other for eternity. Time to fix that with some animations, methinks. At least now it looks a little less odd. For us to set up a dialogue system, we would need some boxes for the dialogue to go in. The portrait box was pretty standard but the box that the dialogue goes in required a metric shit ton of code. 
The borders, in real terms, were literally made up of four corners, two vertical lines and two horizontal ones. These could then be adapted to whatever was required of them, whether it be a side menu, a short text box or a long scrolling exposition dump. Anything. It took a massive amount of setting up would pay dividends in the end. Once that was all in, we added the first NPC that you could chat to in the town. Come to think of it, this is the first NPC I've ever made that wasn't trying to kill the player. As this was a paid course, I can't really show you all the code that went into it, obviously, but I did want to show you this one piece of code that really tickled my dark sense of humour. The comments for this bit of code are destroy the child, in which first you have to find out if there is a child, then you destroy it, and then you go update the parent. So you find the parent, check that they were indeed the parent of the child that you just destroyed, and then in code, let them know that they now have no child. I know loads of programs out there use the concept of parents and child, uh, and inevitably this will, there will be instances out there where the operator needs to get rid of a child element, and that the parent needs to remain persistent and be aware that it's the sole remaining instance. But I just never had to write it, and I, I've never had to write, destroy the child, inform the parent their child is dead. Now that we'd finished killing children, we added a scrollable side menu using the nifty box system set up before. Although a bit of work was needed to do to fix this system, as each time it opened and closed, it wasn't deleting any of the parameters. This, for those of you that don't know, is what's called a memory leak. Left unchecked, it would keep eating up the system memory until eventually a little tiny pixel game would then eventually crash even the most powerful of Master Race PCs. With that in check, we then added some follow-on menus. Now you can see the advantages of using the adaptive box system. It keeps all the boxes consistent to the same unified theme, whilst not needing lots and lots of different size sprites for each sub-box. After adding some functionality, like the ability to use or drop items, and get a briefing description of each item, the menu system was really starting to take shape. This functionality was then added to the battle room, bit by bit, with associated animations, and then juice. All these little steps take a not so little amount of code and they all add up to make a not so little improvement. Okay, so we've got random encounters, we've got menus, we've got dialogue. What else does an RPG need? Leveling. As the tutorials progressed, each step improved on the mechanics just a little bit more. Adding more info and actions to the menus and refining the combat so both the player and the enemy could choose to defend as well as adding two really cool looking spells. Now that the combat was almost complete, it was time to add some world building, with a very witty and well written cutscene to start the game. We got the saving and loading in place, we added some music and some sound effects, and a game over screen, and a run state. And then it all just stopped. There was one assignment that I hadn't done, which was to open up one of the houses and add a door opening sound effect to it, but that was it. Looking through the project, there were loads of rooms, assets and menu options left unused, and I had a cold feeling that the series has been cut short. I thought perhaps it was because I was doing a beta course for the backers, and now that it was up on Udemy there would be loads more follow on content, but no, it was exactly the same course. Looking through the discussions on Discord and the tutorial itself, a few people had commented that this was sort of a, a bare bones course uh, and it was just there to set you up and that you should go and fill the rest in and let your creativity run wild. But I'm not sure I'd buy that. If that was the case, why go to the trouble of creating a cave entrance, three more rooms that follow on from it, a mayor's house, a blacksmith's house, a tavern, and why are there a bunch of character designs, some with animations and some without? I mean, even the thumbnail for the course has an enemy that's not actually in the project. In my opinion, Benjamin just bit off more than he could chew. And, and, and kudos to him. He's an amazingly talented guy, uh, and this was a massively ambitious project. The amount of work that's gone into the series is staggering. And, and what's there is a real testament to his ability. But looking at the course as a whole, I can't help thinking that maybe he should have just made a Kickstarter for the game that Westwick could have been, rather than the tutorial series that it became. 
I know I could get into a lot of flack for this, and I kind of feel a bit like it's biting the hand that feeds, but I don't feel that Westwick is finished. I mean, if it's not clear to all you guys by now, I have the deepest respect for Benjamin and his talents. I've done five of his courses, paid for four, and one of them I was a Kickstarter backer for. I've spoken to him online several times, and I've always found him to be a very likeable and honest guy. I have no doubt that he entered into Westwick wanting to make the best tutorial series yet. I mean, that much is clear just by the sheer scope of this project. But I just feel that this course, in all honesty, just fell short. Okay guys, that's it. Alright, that uh, this, was, uh, this was quite a hard one. Um, I mean, it's a... Uh, it's certainly a fairly long tutorial series. I don't know if it's any longer than Super Cave Boy, um, but it's certainly a good length, and it's far more complicated than Super Cave Boy is. I mean, an awful lot more complicated. I'm not even entirely sure how much I actually learned out of this one. Uh, it's not to kind of say that I knew it all or anything, just that it was. It seemed to be like a much bigger jump than I was expecting. Like. It's described as an intermediate course, but I kind of almost think that maybe it's slightly more than that, um, because all the beginning, all the beginner courses and everything that I've done, you write the code and, and whoever it is, whether it be Benjamin or whether it be Sean, uh, they sort of go through that code and they explain what it is, what it's doing, why you've got it there, and then they use examples and they show things like like, like that. On this one we were doing sort of more advanced code and there was a significant amount of right so we'll just add this, we'll add this and we'll add this and it was almost as though that was sort of taken for granted as though kind of like you know well you know what all this lot is and there was loads of chunks of that stuff that I just didn't know what it was I mean some of it was explained very well um, there was bits where he was using JavaScript as well which is the first time I've ever used JavaScript um, and those bits were like you know quite interesting and, and some of the bits about setting up um, sort of date structures and things that was all it was all some good stuff in there I just feel that maybe potentially this was a little bit further on than sort of an intermediate course um, I mean having said that obviously you can go a lot further as well further still than this um, but yeah I you know I found this course quite a di difficult one uh, there was an awful lot of times where I felt I was literally just copying what was up there and not really um, potentially participating which may very well be that I'm not particularly bright so that I am um, more than willing to accept that <laughs> more than willing to accept that so yeah um, but anyway that's I mean that's the end of, of this particular game making uh, story um, so yeah I hope you enjoyed the video um, I would still go and check out uh, Westwick um, I mean it was the end game or the, the bit that you left with there's stupid amounts of potential, there's so much there left to do and like, and as I said, there's an awful lot of unused rooms, there's a lot of other things that you could do with that. Uh, if you were willing to sit and take the time and to really run through it, you could potentially make a very, very large and expansive game out of that. It's kind of, it is all set there. Um, for me, on the other hand, I kind of look at it as uh, if I was going to take all of that time and effort into building a project, I would build my own project. So thank you very much for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know this has been a long while coming. Um, so don't forget, if you enjoyed the video, rate, comment, and subscribe. Please hit that subscribe button, and please hit the likes. Share among everyone that you know that may very well be interested in video game making. And thank you very much. I will see you all on the flip side. I will be back soon. Bye-bye.